Hello and thank you for being here. My name is Ines and I'm up in Haddington in the NUFL Department of Population Health, or more precisely in the Health Economics Research Centre, undertaking a project, very broadly speaking, looking at the handling, analysis and reporting of missing data in patient-reported outcomes along clinical trials. And I'm here today to talk to you about a very small aspect of that research. Um, now, I do understand that not all of you do work in clinical research or in trials at all, um, but I do believe that everything I talk today about is a broadly speaking statistical issue. So missing data is not just obviously refined to clinical trials, it creeps up in any statistical analysis, whether you do policy research, social sciences research, or if you design and analyze your own studies, or if you're looking at other people's studies trying to evaluate and assess them, or even if you just read research papers where people had to deal with missing data. If you want to interpret and understand them properly, you need to be aware of some of the issues around missing data. And I hope after that talk, that will be a little bit more clear to everyone. So just a brief slide of where I'm trying to go today. So I'm talking about background of missing data, so we're all in the same boat. We all know what I mean with certain uh, words or phrases when I talk about PROMs, or patient reported outcome measures, how I define missing data in my research and how it's broadly defined, and why it is such a problem in the analysis of randomized controlled clinical trials and statistic as a whole. I introduce you very briefly to the current guidance for missing data and statistical analysis, which I think is important for the results of the literature review I actually did uh, to understand where people are and where they're going wrong potentially. And there are a brief session on a uh, sort of discussion and conclusion about yeah, where we are and where we should be or where we, where we would be wanting to go if we want to do things properly. So, first of all, PROMs, short for Patient Reported Outcome Measures. They are often designed in questionnaire form to capture patients' perception on their quality of life, their pain, their disease burdens, their function and symptoms, to assess really how patients feel with the disease they're living at or with the medication or drugs they're receiving. They are increasingly used in clinical research and research in general because researchers, clinicians, regulatory bodies, bodies and funders, who obviously fund our research, are becoming increasingly aware of the importance of taking into account patients' view when they're making healthcare decisions, which are ultimately affecting patients' scare, uh, care. And this is obviously in contrast to more traditional measures such as blood pressure and, and death, for example, which are very objective. We now try to take into account something a bit more uh, subjective in patients' views. So that's great, but there's a problem with these. Because rather than just um, you know, relying on patients to attend their assessment and retake their measurements. We are now relying on our study participants to fill in these questionnaires and not just fill them in, but fill them in in a timely fashion. We need them on time. We need them to be completed as a whole, not just a few questions, and we need to answer the questions properly. If they don't do that, we have missing data. So, missing data. Should be something very obvious. And missing data, in my research, I mainly look at missing outcome data, so what we want to assess about patients, but missing data could obviously also appear in the explanatory variables, the ones you're wanting to use in your model to explain an outcome. So I define missing data as something that we intended to collect in our study, and which is relevant for the analysis, either because it's the outcome in your statistical model or something you use in your statistical model to explain your outcome and that is important for the interpretation to understand how you got to the results and why they're important or not. But for some reason, that data is unavailable when you come to your analysis. And anyone who ever deals with any analysis or data collection will know that this is something that occurs very commonly. And often, people think that might be just a stats issue. When I go to design studies, or set up studies with clinicians they, and I press this issue of missing data and I say, oh, we really need to think about this, we need to talk about this, we need to make sure we address missing data properly. They often very patronizingly pat my head and say, oh, Ines, you know, don't worry about it now. You can do that later in the analysis. It's nothing we have to worry about now. And then I take a very deep breath to calm myself and I go into explaining why missing data is such a problem in any sort of analysis you might be doing, whether it's clinical trials or whether it's any other research you do. And the problem is that no statistical analysis, however advanced, however great, however computationally intensive it might be, can ever replace the information we might have received if we had followed up our patients properly, if we had received all the data we wanted to collect. And this is because 
there are very strong assumptions related to any analysis, including missing data. And I talk about the assumptions and the approaches we could take on the next slide for a minute. For now, we just know that we're making very strong assumptions, but obviously if we get those wrong, even just a little bit, that results in our model being inappropriate and our results being biased, i.e. wrong. And this is really where it stops being just a statistical issue, something I worry about, and this is where it starts affecting patient healthcare or decision-making process in, in politics and funding or anywhere you might implement your results. Because if you base, say, healthcare decisions in this case, on biased trial results, you're giving patients not the best care they should be getting. So we could effectively be harming patients if we are basing our healthcare decisions on biased trials, which could be caused by missing data. Now, I know a lot of you don't have a statistical background, and I hope you don't need one. I'll just very briefly go through a couple of examples of the approaches we might need or might make or take in statistical analysis and the assumptions related to those and the problems with those. So the first case or first thing people often do with missing data analysis is take a complete case approach. This, in very simple terms, means that you exclude every patient, every participant from your data set with missing data and just focus on those who have some data you can analyze. And if you use any conventional statistical package, this is a standard approach that's done automatically for you without asking for permission, without telling you of the you know, potential really bad effects that might have. So why is it that bad? It seems like a very logical approach. The problem is that we're making an assumption that those with missing data are exactly the same than those who have atten attended all assessments. And that's quite a lot to ask for, usually, because often patients might drop out because they're not doing very well on the medication they're on. Maybe they're having worse outcomes than everyone else, and they're deciding the trial isn't for them. They're sick of trying now. So if we exclude those from our analysis, we are, un we are overestimating the treatment effect. We're thinking the drug or the medication is a lot better than it really is. Again, if we give it to patients now, we are potentially preventing them from getting medication that is better for them. Similarly, patients with adverse events or adverse reactions to the drug might drop out because they're feeling the drug is not working for them. Again, excluding them from the analysis and from the results is underestimating the potential harm the drug might be having. So if we prescribe the drug widely because we think our analysis showed that it was good for patients, we're harming those patients because we have not taken into account the potential harms that drug might cause. There are a few more sophisticated approaches to missing data. The first of all is the single mutation approach, where we are basically, in a more or less sophisticated manner, make up a data point to substitute for any missing observation we have. We could do this based on a regression model, we could base it on means for males, females, for older or younger patients, but we're making it up at the end of the day. Um, I don't know if any of you work in clinical research, there's something called the last observation carried forward method, which if a patient says turns up for the first two assessments but drops out afterwards, we keep using that observation he had at that last assessment we saw him. Are you assuming his health state is not changing? And if you're looking at something that is a deteriorating disease, such as Parkinson's disease, you know that patients get worse no matter on what drug they are. So by pretending they're staying at their health state, where really they are deteriorating, we are again overestimating the effect of that drug. We think it's better than it really is. The other thing about these single limitation approaches is that we are pretending we know where that patient is. And we're sticking it on our analysis model, and we're not telling the program that we're not sure about these values. So the program thinks, oh, you know, these were all observed, and it doesn't take into account any uncertainty about values we effectively made up. Multi-mutation approaches go a little bit further. They introduce a bit of error in our terms, so now our model can account for uncertainty around observations we made up, basically, and it, it puts a bit more var var <coughs> uh, variability in our results. So we now take into account that we observed some data and we had some missing data, but we made a sophisticated guess of what they might be. There are some other approaches which I'm not going to go into, but they all basically assume that based on some of the data we observed, maybe the one we collected when patients first entered the study, maybe their gender or their age, we can make a very sophisticated guess about what health state or what symptoms level they would have throughout their trial. Again, that's a very strong assumption because maybe it's related to something completely different. Maybe it's related to something we did not observe. 
And that's where sensitivity analysis comes in. So we need to vary the assumptions. We can't always assume that we can really explain the missing data. Maybe we want to assume that those who dropped out are feeling a lot worse or having more side effects. This is where sensitivity analysis is coming in to enable us to really assess how robust our results are based on the missing data we have observed. So that's some of the methodology around missing data. And there is a whole wealth of papers out there that tell you how you should analyze your data, how you should deal with different types of missing data. And I came across quite a good paper by Lee et al., which was published at the beginning of last year, 2014, which sort of consolidated all the literature out there in a set of 10 standards that should be applied in any kind of research where you may come across missing data. Most of them are very much common sense. They say that studies should be designed in a way that you minimize missing data. You should make sure you can follow up their patients. You don't burden them with a million questionnaires, as people often do. Do something simple. Make sure you can get the data you really need for the analysis. If patients drop out, maybe due to side effects, maybe adverse reactions, you know, try and keep continuing to look, collect data on them so we know where they are throughout their disease process. And try to get reasons for why patients drop out because that will help us to assess how robust our assumptions are or how good they are and in effect the model we're using. They're also saying to account for uncertainty about missing values, i.e. avoid the single imputation methods I just mentioned where we're just making up a value and pretend we know that patient was feeling like that on a day, which we obviously don't, and to conduct sensitivity analysis to make sure we know how our results would vary if we change the assumptions we're making in our model. Again, common sense is that we should account for all patients that enter the study because if you drop some of them, again, we have missing data and that might bias our results. And we should clearly report on how we handled missing data and the potential influence it might have on the results because that will enable any readers of our research to assess how good the results are. Now, that's a bit of background. So then I went about undertaking some of my own research and looked at papers that were published in the last couple of years to see how authors dealt with that issue. And the results or the findings I had were quite sobering. Despite all the literature out there, all the advice that's very approachable, that's very easy for you to implement, people just disregarded. They pretend it was never out there, they never heard about it. They, uh, there's a huge discrepancy between what people should be doing and how they report their studies and how they analyze them. Again, this is a problem because we know that the inappropriate methodology int can introduce bias. And if you're into pop science and you read sort of Ben Goldegger books, uh, he's got about 150 pages on the problem of missing data in his book if you read Bad Science or Bad Pharma. So it's not just something in my own world, it's something out there and there have been examples of drugs being taken off the market because we have now realized they were analyzed inappropriately and they are harming patients, so we had to take them off the market. So we want healthcare decisions to be robust and based on proper analysis. So I'd like to conclude my talk by some advice from the paper I quoted earlier, who are saying that the single best approach to missing data is to prevent data, missing data current prospectively through good study design and good uh, data follow-up, which obviously needs to be supplemented by appropriate analysis because there will always be some missing data, but we need to try and reduce it. There's a last slide just to thank my supervisors and my funder, which is enabling me to undertake my research. And I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any.